organized by the program on extremism uh, here at the George Washington University. I am senior research fellow Sergio Altuna Galan, and I'm honored to serve as, as your moderator for today's discussion. Thank you for joining us. This event uh, is the first of a two-part series dedicated to examining the complex security landscape in this head region. Today, we have placed the focus on jihadist militancy in the region, and with the help of our experts, who have so generously agreed to share their knowledge with us, we'll try to establish a state-of-the-art uh, among jihadist organizations operating in the Sahel, exploring uh, the reasons behind their, behind their notable uh, expansion in size, the scope of operations, the capabilities, and their overall impact. We'll also try to identify and analyze uh, the existing challenges facing the region uh, while considering plausible scenarios for the future. Additionally, I'd like to take this opportunity, uh, as people keep getting in, to announce that the second event of this two-part series is scheduled for late May. While this event places the focus on jihadist militancy, the second event, titled The Seha Security Conundrum, will focus, as it can be deduced from the title, on what we might call the closing of a, of a chapter after the demise of uh, regional security initiatives in the Sahel. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, security structures in the Sahel are undergoing a profound transformation. The year 2023 really marked the end of an era. Several key bilateral, bilateral sorry, and multilateral security and peacekeeping mechanisms once hailed as the bulk work against extremism and in place for nearly a decade were dissolved. I'm sure it will be enormously interesting, especially uh, considering that in recent days, uh, it seems to have been confirmed that uh, the approximately 1,000 American military personnel will also leave Niger in the coming months. Details, of course, regarding the upcoming event that I already said will take place in late May will be shared in uh, the following weeks. So just please, uh, stay tuned. But let's go back to what uh, brought us here today. Let me just go through the structure of the event uh, pretty quickly. It is a quite simple one. We will run for approximately one and a half hours. Each panel, each panelist will deliver a, a fifteen-minute uh, presentation keynote uh, on various aspects of the main topic. And following these presentations, we will transition into a Q and A session where we'll have the opportunity to address uh, questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, let me grab this opportunity to encourage you all to actively participate by submitting your questions through the uh, chat feature, if I may say, of the Zoom uh, app. Uh, we hope this interactive format uh, allows for a dynamic exchange of ideas and fosters engagement uh, between the speakers and the attendees. That is our really our, our objective. We look forward uh, to receive your uh, insightful queries. Uh, really allow me to say I'm really excited to facilitate this timely event with our esteemed panelists to whom I once again would like to extend, extend my warmest welcome. So before diving into the discussion, just allow me to introduce our guests uh, in the order they will speak. Today, here at the program on extremism, we're honored uh, to host three highly skilled, experienced, knowledgeable uh, experts uh, who are joining us today from different uh, locations. In fact, three different continents, although I can see that Mr. Uh, Ud Mahmoud is not yet uh, connected. I hope he succeeds in, do, uh, succeeds in doing so. So first up speaking will be uh, Wasim Nasser. He's a France 24 journalist and a SOFAN Center uh, Senior Research Fellow. He's been focusing and monitoring jihadist groups and dynamics in the Middle East and in Africa, as well as the European responses to this phenomenon for as long as I can remember. He's also the author of uh, Etat Islamique, Le Fait Accompli. For those of you, I don't know if it's been translated, you'll tell us later, uh, Wasim, but for those of you uh, who can read French is a really nice uh, read. I highly recommend it. Bienvenue, Wasim. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, second speaking will be Dr. Uh, Andrew Lebovich, uh, who is a research fellow 
within the Sehel program at the Klingeldahl uh, Institute Conflict Research Unit. He's also a postdoctoral fellow with the Danish Institute for International Studies, and he's conducted research in and on the Sahel and North Africa for more than a decade, uh, focusing on armed group mobilization, political and religious movements, and geopolitical competition. Welcome, uh, Andrew. And last but not least, if we, uh, as I said, succeed in, in bringing him online, uh, we have uh, Mr. Dahan Wold Ahmed Bahmoud, who is uh, the director of the Mauritanian Institute for Strategic Studies. Throughout his career, he's held uh, top uh, high level political and diplomatic positions, including Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation, Minister of Information, as well as uh, by Secretary General of the Council of Arab Interior Ministers and Chief Representative of the Arab League in, in several occasions. Just allow me a short contextualizing introduction before leaving the floor to uh, our panelists. I, I promise I won't uh, take long. So what, why is it important and timely to address the state of art of jihadist militancy in the Sahel? So the emergence of, of jihadism in the Sahel captured global attention when uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb succeeded in establishing an Islamic Emirate in Northern Mali back in 2012. That is when the alarms went off, right? Of course, uh, aware of the great potential of the enormous arc of instability that constitutes region uh, for the development of its uh, activities, the jihadist movement uh, was present and working on it since well before, since, since, since as early as 2018. Back then, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb that had freshly been transformed into one of Al-Qaeda's regional branches uh, from the GSPC, had just succeeded in establishing one of its uh, brigades in the region, the Katiba Tarak bin Ziyad. What was initially established as a strategic rear base has uh, arguably become uh, Aquim's main front. Let's not forget that the situation in the Sahel uh, differs significantly from that in the Maghreb, especially in Algeria, where the Algerian security forces have succeeded in reducing uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb's capacities to really historic lows, and the terrorist organization has been unable to carry out uh, large-scale uh, attacks for a very long time. <coughs> Sorry. Now back to 2012, it is true that the French military intervention when jihadists threatened to overthrow the regime in Mamako managed to regain the territories for Malian sovereignty. Without it, the consequences would have been disastrous. However, neither uh, Operation uh, Serval, later renamed Barhan, nor different multinational anti-terrorist initiatives created to contain terrorist expansions have managed to affect the group's capacities in a significant or sustained manner over time. Quite the contrary, I'd say, the situation has been progressively deteriorating in the region. Currently, not only are there more jihadist organizations active in the region, but also their area of operations has also has expanded substantially. So in March 2017, drawing on lessons learned, uh, learned in the region, uh, Aquim succeeded in establishing in its own uh, Sahelian uh, affiliate, Jama'at Nusrat al-Islam wal muslimin also called Janim, now extending its reach far from its traditional stronghold across the central Sahel. As for the presence of the other prominent global jihadist organization, the Islamic State, it has two active affiliates in the region. On the one hand, at Sahel province, formerly known as uh, Islamic State in the Great Sahara, uh, born in 2015 from a split of al murab Bitun, and uh, mainly active, to say it short, in the tri-border between uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. On the other hand, the Islamic State's West Africa province was born from a split from Boko Haram, uh, which, by the way, also continues to operate as a separate organization. The... Just to conclude, death toll figures confirm that the panorama outlined by the large number of active groups. The Sahel has emerged as the global epicenter of jihadist violence in recent years. 
the numbers speak for themselves. In 2008, the region accounted for only 1% of global terrorist fatalities. By 2022, that figure had risen to 43%, with Mali and Burkina Faso accumulating more than 70% of the total victims in the region. In addition, a reality that should not be ignored is that the geographical range of action of some of these organizations has extended to coastal countries of the Gulf of Guinea, with recurrent attacks in Benin, Togo, Ivory Coast, or Ghana, a region really previously considered to be the outside of the reach, I'd say, and the global gateway to the region, if I may say. Now, without further delay, let me give the floor to the first of our panelists, Wasim Nasser, uh, one of the leading, leading experts, a very fine connoisseur of the jihadist militancy in Africa, so he can better explain to us uh, which are these, uh, in deep detail, I mean, uh, which are these different actors right now, what are the real capacities, and and what are the different uh, the differences between them? Wasim, bienvenue. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, hello. Thank you for this kind uh, kind uh, introduction and for this opportunity to speak among such uh, knowledgeable uh, knowledgeable people, uh, knowledgeable bearded people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I will try to be uh, to be short and to be uh, straight to the point. What I'm gonna what I'm gonna say. Actually, we have two main groups acting today in uh, in the Sahel region, uh, meaning uh, the Islamic State uh, with its Sahel province and uh, the Al Qaeda Sahel affiliate, meaning today Jamaat Nusra al Islam Muslimin, headed by uh, Iyad uh, Iyad Agali. So I think that many, uh, many of us here know who are we talking about. So I'll try to speak maybe about uh, main differences that occurred between the two groups uh, uh, lately. We are seeing a new dynamic actually uh, in the war. Uh, um, uh, a subsequent dynamic uh, in the war between the Islamic State and, uh, and the Al-Qaeda affiliates, meaning Jnim, since 2019. We are still seeing uh, uh, big battles uh, between the two, the two groups, even though from time to time, like these times now, we have kind of uh, kind of calm uh, between between them. But the thing is that since 2019, didn't move move much actually. Al Qaeda is still uh, being able to contain the expansion of the uh, Islamic State. And the Islamic State is consolidating its, uh, its, um, its area of, uh, of influence in uh, mainly uh, in Menaka, Mali, and uh, neighboring uh, Ansongo. So the new thing about this war is that, and uh, which, uh, which should be taken into consideration today when we speak about jihadi groups uh, in the Sahara region, is that actually it is Al-Qaeda which is preventing the Islamic State from going further south, meaning into the uh, countries of the Gulf of Guinea. And uh, most importantly, it's Al-Qaeda which is preventing uh, the Islamic State from recruiting be beyond its uh, usual uh, or historic bassin of recruitment, meaning the uh, mainly the uh, Fulani uh, Tolobe uh, group and uh, some uh, Tuareg groups and Arabs in uh, in Mali. So uh, it is quite uh, it is quite interesting to note that in this new dynamic, it is not local armies or local security forces who are preventing the Islamic State from expanding, but it is Al Qaeda, meaning the Islamic State which posed a real uh, military and security threat in the region and which brought in uh, European special forces uh, which, were, which were labeled as SAB or called uh, SAB and contained the group uh, for, a, for, a, for, a, uh, for a while is still posing the same kind of threat. We saw, uh, we saw important attacks in the Tel Aviv region uh, since the beginning of 2024 with high scores of uh, Nigerian, Nigerian military killed and even uh, Nigerian uh, militias or local defense forces because since the coup, Niger also uh, took the same path as Mali and Burkina Faso. 
which does not help actually beyond the communication uh, efforts and and brings maybe also some uh, disastrous uh, consequences on uh, on civilians because just for for uh, for like a, a remark regarding this issue we know that al qaeda attacked civilians in tel uh, a few months back now which didn't happen actually since years uh, which was only done by the Islamic State. And the argumentation beyond attacking the civilians was the same which is used by the Islamic State, meaning those civilians are constituting militias to fight us on our uh, territory. So, and Niger today became also a space of competition between the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, both attacking uh, security forces. Uh, the biggest attacks are conducted by the Islamic State, small attacks by uh, conducted by Al-Qaeda, but it is like... Uh, both are planting their 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 flag the further uh, as they can you know the one of the ieds that was put by al qaeda was like less than 20 kilometers away from Niamey. even if the result isn't that important uh, meaning the but the damage done wasn't that important but it was it was a show of force and the latest attack that i was talking about uh, done by the islamic state which killed more than 30 uh, uh, niger's uh, military was done in what was usually thought to be al qaeda territory you see so they, they did not fight yet in niger but they are both expanding their areas of of uh, of uh, of influence. All this to say that the Islamic State is still uh, being considered as a security and military threat, but Al Qaeda, on the other hand, uh, poses security and military uh, 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 challenges, but also constitutes a political challenge, uh, actually, because it's getting more and more entrenched in uh, local politics, especially uh, in Mali. And I was asked a question yesterday, and I was asked, like, why isn't Jnim or Jamaat Fasal Muslimin conducting important attacks in Mali as it is doing in Burkina Faso? Because in Burkina Faso, we're seeing, like, huge attacks each, like, each couple of weeks, uh, okay? And my answer was, what was clear to me, maybe it wasn't clear to everybody, but what's clear to me is that uh, Al-Qaeda is so entrenched in Mali, that uh, northern Mali and central Mali, that it doesn't need to conduct a huge attacks today. So the dynamic isn't the same. They are at home, so they don't need to conduct huge attacks. They can only concentrate their efforts on attacking uh, hard targets like in Sevare, like in Kati, uh, which are much much more symbolic uh, than, uh, than uh, the Sikh is to, to, be, to make symbolic attacks, the aim actually, and not to uh, conduct attacks as they used, used to do before, meaning attacking um, army barracks and attacking the military in a very blunt and direct way, which, was, which is actually happening in Burkina Faso, we saw it in Jibu, we saw it in other areas, and we, saw, we are seeing it more and more also in, uh, in neighboring Benin. Uh, so in neighboring Benin, done by people from Benin, but we know that the recruiters were formed, were, um, were uh, dogm dogmatically and militarily formed in Burkina Faso, as the Burkina Bay at one, time, one point in time were formed also in, uh, in Central Mali. So this is the new dynamic in my, uh, in my sense. And another, uh, in, among the jihadi groups, and another issue that which should, should be taken into consideration today and makes a huge difference between Al Qaeda and the Islamic State. That Al Qaeda is doing politics also, also with um, with local uh, local power brokers and local governments. To some extent, they had open channels. Not to some extent, to a real good extent, they had open channels of negotiation with the with Bazoum's administration. Uh, uh, which was quite working, uh, which led to the liberation, for example, of the American nun uh, that was abducted next to Jibo in Burkina Faso and liberated at uh, in Makalondi. Uh, that's one thing uh, to say. But on the other hand, we saw and we see, as I said, they do not attack uh, uh, soft targets, soft Western targets, as they used to do before. So the last attack conducted by Al-Qaeda in this regard was the attack of Aziz Istanbul back in 2017. And we know today that the deliberation of the last three uh, Italian hostages, they have no more Western hostages. And we saw, for example, the first video appearance of Iada Ghali, which occurred a few uh, months back, his first appearance since 2017 and the creation 
or at least going public with uh, Jamaat al Salam was Muslimin. He talked uh, especially about Wagner, the Russians, and local juntas. And France was mentioned like once. Just, uh, as we say in France, it's minimum syndical. He should at one point mention, uh, mention, <laughs> mention France, you know. Uh, and on the other hand, we saw Jafar Diko who's the head of Jnim today in Burkina Faso, going out in a video for the first time ever and, and with many messages. But the most important message in my sense, and maybe Andrew uh, can agree or, or not or add upon it, the most important part of it was his call uh, to Turkey to stop selling drones to local juntas, you see, because they say local juntas are using drones and they are killing civilians, which is true. But they are also harming the jihadi groups, but in an indiscriminate way, which is backfiring at the end at the end of the day. But it's interesting to say that we have here the most powerful Al Qaeda figure in Burkina Faso doing his first ever video, and this first ever video calling upon the Turks to pressure the government and, uh, and on the Turkish government to stop selling drones to the to the juntas. So we are seeing here we are in really we are seeing politics at play as maybe we used to see with other uh, insurrectional factions before what we know to be with what we knew to be like the war on terror etc etc so we see that those players have those players have political agendas and political agendas that are adapting to the local uh, uh, dynamics which means uh, as we say in arabic which is like the jurisprudence of reality and it is really outplaying in the Sahara region because the, the the sole success of Al Qaeda is outplaying in the Sahara region. All the other experiences were failures. Maybe we can talk about the Shabab, which is, is not a failure, but it's very the Shabab are very specific. But if we look at all other experiences from the Levant to other areas and to Africa, to other Africa, the only success of Al Qaeda is outplaying the Sahara region, while this Sahel affiliate of Al Qaeda is going further away from what we used to know as Al-Qaeda Central and its, uh, its uh, dogma. So here's what I have to say. I hope I wasn't that long, and I'll be happy to answer all, all, uh, all your, uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wasim, for providing uh, such a detailed and uh, rigorous uh, description of the state of affairs and the current dynamics in such a vast region. It's uh, difficult to to extract uh, general trends as scenarios differs uh, differ so much. Uh, let me uh, welcome again, or after uh, solving the technical uh, issues, uh, Mr. Dahan uh, Ahmed Mahmoud. Uh, welcome, uh, Dahan. Does the audio work for you? Not yet. Okay, I hope we can solve that last uh technical issues uh, before your, your, your speech. Now, to explain, among all the things, how we've reached uh, this point and uh, to delve somehow into the reasons behind their uh, the expansion of uh, different jihadi organizations and branches uh, active, their expansion in size, in scope of operations, uh, capabilities, the, uh, the 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 growing size of their political agenda. I would like to yield the floor to Dr. Uh, Andrew Lebovich. Andrew. Great. Well, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Sergio, and thank you also to my to my various TV co-panelists and Wasim. Uh, it's always both a a problem and a good thing to come after Wasim speaking because he he tends to cover things very well. And so there's uh, there's not much for me to do except agree. And I think anyone probably saw me nodding along with many of his points. Um, so I'll I'll also try to be brief just to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, but I want to I want to cover a couple of things. The first is to echo um, something that Wasim said that I think is a very important point. When we're looking at the durability of these groups in the region, there are a number of factors, and I have kind of three main ones. But I, it's really important to emphasize the role of politics and to emphasize that these are, even the Islamic State, to an extent, is a political organization, but JNIM has delved much more deeply into politics. And so this brings me really to my first point, which is the very one of the reasons for the durability of these groups is their very longstanding embeddedness locally. And so even during the early stages of the GSPC's implantation in Northern Mali, 
we saw a number of efforts to, to really embed themselves in the social fabric, the political fabric, and even the economic fabric of these regions. Uh, for instance, I remember even in um, in 2011, hearing stories about Al-Qaeda uh, basically offering interest-free loans, so Islamic-compatible loans in Timbuktu, uh, going back several years, doing things like conducting vaccination campaigns for animals in 2006 and 2007. So exercising forms of, of local cooperation, I guess what, what we might call development assistance, but really exercising politics and showing themselves to be political and social actors that could that could behave and that could be sort of natural in these milieu, but then also recruiting locally and placing a significant emphasis on local recruitment, even when this became uh, a point of tension, for instance, and led to the split with, uh, and led to the formation of Mujao in 2011, partially over some of these conflicts about who was promoted, who was allowed to function. Um, but so these groups are, they're very locally, but they're very adaptive. And JNM in particular has shown itself to be able and willing to adapt its strategies over time. Uh, and this has been something very important, for instance, in central Mali, where, um, where after about 2016, when there was a significant local reaction to some of the harsher efforts to implement uh, James' vision, or what was then Ketibat uh, Messina, their vision of the Sharia, there was an, a very aggressive adaptation on the part of the group to relax some of their strictures and to essentially go to communities and instead of simply presenting themselves as implementing their vision of the Sharia, actually saying that they would support, that they would escort communities, that they would help protect them as long as certain rules were respected. Um, and this also went hand in hand with the strategy of referring back, for instance, to older forms of jurisprudence, but, but forms of jurisprudence that are very specific to central Mali, for instance. Uh, so referring to the 19th century jihad Padina, and and really starting to use the the fiqh from the dina period and from scholars under the dina as part of their own interpretations and their own uh, their own governance in central mali and so i think this is this is a very important thing and i'll get to i'll get to the point about governance a bit more as i close i would say the second the second very important aspect of the uh, of the durability and the expansion of these groups, uh, again, particularly JNM, but also the Islamic State Sahel province, has been quite disastrous counterterrorism efforts across the region for several years. And there's a tendency now, uh, particularly because, let's say, certain European actors have a desire to um, erase or ignore some of their own failings and put a heavy emphasis on Russia and Russian uh, partnered counterterrorism efforts, but these go back to the the militia strategy, for instance, that Basim mentioned, particularly in um, in Menaka and parts of Tilbury, where the French-led cooperation with certain Malian militias, uh, Gatia and the MSA, uh, was quite significant in terms of fueling recruitment. And really, I think we can say that the the massive increase in capability and in, in some cases, local support and local capacity for what was then the Islamic State in the greater in the greater Sahara, now the Islamic State Sahel province, was fueled by those counterterrorism practices and particularly by the abuses against local communities, uh, Fulani communities, but also some Tuareg communities by these militias. And so I think there was a very, that played a very important role in actually resuscitating and giving new attention uh, to the Islamic State. And we've also seen in Burkina Faso the fact that uh, aggressive counterterrorism policies from the government and partnerships with militias, so first uh, sort of adaptations of local hunters, uh, the Kuryogo, uh, local self-defense militias, and then later the Volontaire pour la Défense de la Patrie, or the VDP, and the abuses that they've committed locally has played a very significant role, not just in fueling recruitment among traditional groups um, to the Islamic State and to Janim, but in fact, to helping them, helping them broaden their base of support beyond some of these sort of traditional communities, if we can call it that. Now, the backbone of these groups still remains in many areas, uh, Fulani from different Fulani communities, different Fulani lineages, in other cases, uh, Tuareg and Arab supporters, 
but it has broadened beyond that. And JNIM in particular has uh, has made an effort, in some cases a more concerted effort than others, but they've made an effort nonetheless to broaden that recruitment. And that's come in part as they've expanded their, their geographical reach. And this is also part of their own durability, is that as JNIM has expanded, um, they've often framed themselves as responding to the needs of local communities. I'm thinking, for instance, of how Jainim described their entry into Benin, into Northern Benin, they described it very explicitly as being in response to the, the request for protection of local communities who felt that they had been oppressed by security forces. Now, again, this is how Jainim pre presents it, but at the same time, it's an important narrative aspect. And it's also important to understand uh, part of the expansion strategy is driven by fighters themselves. That as again, JNIM in particular recruits from different areas, they also factor in those demands into their own operations. Um, and as they've kept expanding, they're looking for new areas um, near a separate end while consolidating their control in certain areas, particularly in Mali. Um, and, and by example of this, I, I agree completely with what, uh, what Vasim said about the shift in what might be called spectacular attacks or the shift away from more, I, I think how we would see them as more traditional uh, terrorist activities in some cases, which doesn't mean that they're using less violence and it doesn't mean that there's less pressure on civilians. But in, in responding to the question of why there has been this move away over the last several years from striking soft Western affiliated targets, Part of it, and I agree completely with Wasim, is that especially in Mali, uh, there's been so much consolidation of authority, particularly in rural areas, but in rural areas impacting urban areas, that James simply doesn't have the need to do that. And they can focus on not just military targets and uh, and the Vaga group in particular, but they can also focus on, uh, on consolidating their presence in important market villages, for instance, on trade routes, and this is the the next step of their uh, of their expansion that I think is very important is looking at how they've been active on trade axes, uh, not just say between North and Central Mali, not just between Central Mali and um, and further points south, but especially toward border areas uh, toward Cote d'Ivoire, in different parts of Burkina Faso, but then also moving toward Mauritania, Senegal, and the border with Guinea. And so all of this allows them not only to more easily consolidate their authority in areas where there are very few rivals and certainly where security forces can't target them in the same way, but also allows them to be able to exert pressure when they want to. And I think this is also an important part of the strategy is the ability to leverage pressure on urban areas, on trade routes when it suits the group. Um, so again, we, sometimes when we're talking about uh, governing strategies, when we're talking about expansion strategies, there's a focus on JNIM, but part of this is because, again, as Wasim highlighted, JNIM has largely been able to contain the expansion of the Islamic State while quite massively expanding their own geographical reach. And sometimes because of the, the lack of attention generally to the Sahel, uh, particularly among Anglophone audiences, uh, so I'm... I'm based in the United States, in the United States, we see this and elsewhere. Um, and also because of less attention to the region as European forces and European governments have largely pulled out of the Sahel, it's easy to lose sight of the fact of how, uh, how active these groups are. But again, this constitutes in some ways a center, a global center of militant activity and also a proving ground in many cases for governing strategies that militants have used elsewhere and will use elsewhere. Um, and we we see this, there's a, a back and forth debate over the years about kind of where this came from, whether it came from Al-Qaeda Central or whether it came from elsewhere. But many of the governing initiatives that we've seen among jihadist groups elsewhere, as I interpret them, really originated in part in the Sahel. And through the GSPC and Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb's efforts to exert forms of governing authority and to experiment with different kinds of governing authority, and so that that kind of brings me into my last point, which is that it's the governing strategy of JNIM in particular that has also contributed to this durability. Uh, and if we take it as an example, Central Mali, but also we can look at Southern Mali, we can look at 
uh, parts of Eastern Burkina Faso, for instance, where we see this, uh, a kind of encirclement and domination of rural areas, but also Jinim providing access to forms of basic security, in some cases more advanced security, particularly in terms of getting back cattle who've been stolen, cutting down on banditry, but then providing justice. And, and it's easy to be a bit dismissive of this, but the, the governing structures and the justice structures that Jinim brings to bear in different areas are quite significant. Again, they're, they're sometimes best developed in parts of northern Mali and central Mali, but they're able to provide, uh, and as Wasim pointed out, not just military training, but ideological training and ideological training and a kind of formation in Janim's jurisprudence. And this is a very important thing, particularly, again, in rural areas, but even in urban areas where access to justice can be very difficult. It can be very complicated. It can be very expensive for people in many cases to try to seek uh, justice and representation in court, whereas Janim does not do that. Again, they exert plenty of other uh, influence through violence, through pressure, but there often is very much a carrot and stick, if we can call it that. Um, so, for instance, in in some of the villages in central Mali, where uh, Janim enforced or signed local truces or peace accords with villages and with other militias, uh, it tended to be that only when those truces were broken did Jinim come in and try to exert a much harsher vision of the Sharia that they actually inf have enforced uh, with more violence and more pressure on communities. But it tends to happen only after the accords are broken in the first place. So they still present the option of having a governing system that they oversee that people can choose to follow with more violence coming in reaction to efforts to push back against that justice system. But it is this governance, and it is this alternative political vision, I think we can call it that, that has made them not just very resilient as an organization, but has allowed them to continue expanding into many of these areas, not just through military means, not just through pressure, but because of their very active outreach. And again, what the team highlighted, this engagement in politics, this engagement in national politics, uh, the regional politics, but also hyper local politics in many cases that allows them to gather information, that allows them to know where they can expand, where they can be safer. And then, of course, how they can try to implant themselves in local communities, particularly in areas that for, for generations and in some cases longer have faced uh, conflict and have faced disagreement over lineage. Uh, over the heritage of, um, of slavery, for instance, especially we see this in Western Mali, and then uh, particularly in conflicts over land tenure and the allocation of resources, which has been a very important part of their governing strategy and a very important part of their justice provision. And it's something that presents not just a model, but presents a real demonstration of how they can be, again, a genuine, in some cases, political alternative to the governments in place. I think I'll wrap it up there and I look forward to everyone's questions. Well, uh, thank you very much for such uh, enlightening uh, insights on, on how we got here or what uh, makes possible for these groups to be uh, growing in size and expansion and goals and in, in tactics and in uh, everything. Uh, let me just uh, check real quick, uh, Mr. Uh, old uh, Ahmed Mahmoud, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Marhaba, ahlan wa sahlan. Okay, so I already introduced you to our audience. I'm very happy we solved our technical issues. And uh, I leave the floor to you. Considering your extensive experience and knowledge, uh, I'm sure you'll definitely provide a really insightful analysis regarding security situation in the region and the arising challenges. Just one very quick thing. Uh, I already received a couple of questions, but I do encourage the audience to keep sending the questions so we can answer them uh, later. The uh, Han, Thank you very much. I'm sorry to be torp, uh, <laughs> to be very 
and knowledgeable on these technical uh, problems. And I have been able, after the help of uh, Rosa, to join. I uh, send my greetings to everyone listening. And um, I wanted to uh, first to highlight some points about the Sahel countries that I hope uh, may be used as a frame to put all the information that we are gathering today. And uh, the second thing I wanted to do is uh, I am speaking only of the, when I'm speaking about the Sahel, I'm speaking only about the countries that used to compose the uh, G5 Sahel. So with this said, uh, the points that I want to put uh, first and uh, to serve as a frame for the, um, the talk on the Sahel is that uh, the first point is that the Sahel uh, is uh, traditionally serving as a bridge between North and Central Africa. It has never been an impassable bar barrier. It has always allowed culture, people, goods to go from south to north and from north to south. The second point is that uh, in this part of Africa, the ethnical uh, comp composition of the population is a mixture of uh, Arab, uh, sub-Saharan, -sub uh, North African. Uh, so it is a mixture of uh, the ethnical, uh, both part of the Sahara. And it is quite, um, say most of us, we have uh, dark skin. It is quite impossible to say this one is Arab or this one is Pearl or Zagawa, uh, just by the color of the, the, the skin. I think this is important to not to, to understand some of the problem of the Sahara. The third point is that the Sahelians are nomadic herders. They used to cruise all over the Sahel, just following their herd, looking in quest of water and grass. The third point is that Islam is the dominant religion in the Sahel. You have 51% in Chad, uh, 61 in uh, Burkina Faso, 95 in Niger and Mali, and 99 in Mauritania. The fifth point is that the Sahel covers an area of 5 million square kilometers. That is more than half the area of the United States, more than the area of the, uh, the European Union, The sixth point is in population. Right now, the five countries have around 90 million. That is a third of the US population. And uh, in 2050, the projections say that we put, they put these countries around 200 million. Uh, USA will be around 430. Uh, our actual population is uh, less than the half of the population of Nigeria, the most populous country of the, in Africa. It is uh, more than three times the population of Cote d'Ivoire, five times the population of Senegal, a little more than twice the population of Algeria and a little less than thrice the population of Morocco. The seven points is that the added GDP of the five countries was in 2022, $76 billion. That is a sixth of Nigeria's GDP. A little more than the GDP of Cote d'Ivoire a little less than three times the GDP of Senegal, a little more than a third of uh, the Algerian GDP. Uh, the eighth point is that drug trafficking is skyrocketing in this region. 
the last UN report on the matter noted that seizure of cocaine skyrocketed in the Sahel in 2022 from an average of 13 kilograms per year, a year in, from 2015 to 2020 to 1,466 kilograms in 2022. And more than that, 2023, we have not already all the, the but in Mauritania alone, 2,300 kilograms of cocaine have been seized in June, until June. The big problem here is that the Sahel countries are no longer only a transit zone, but they have become a market for low quality drugs. And this is, this situation is uh, provoking three very bad things, alienating the youth, increasing corruption among security forces and government employees, fueling the violent extremist uh, and criminal group. The UN report noted that uh, drug economy and instability in the Sahel are linked through a vicious circle in which the weak rule of law is facilitating the expansion of the drug, which can in turn provide financial conflict, which then continue to weaken the rule of law. The ninth and last point is our societies are multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-racial, minorities uh, always, uh, often, Feel, tar, feel harmed by democracy. And some members of these minorities, fueled by this situation, look, look, linked to bad governance, extreme poverty, may be attracted to violence. Hence, it is very important for the societies of our countries and their stability to constantly seek the greatest consensus again for the strategic choices. With this frame set, I am going to say that my country, Mauritania, has fought violent extremism by its own thinking, strategies, and means, and has overcome that score since 2011. We never adhere to the strategies built on the thinkings of the likes of Samuel Huntington and others, putting Islam as the enemy and hence as the origin of all harm and evil, including violent extremism. We do not call violent extremism jihadism because we are Muslim and we know that jihad has nothing to do with violent extremism. We do not want to give the violent extremist criminals an aura that they are far from deserving by calling them jihadists. The other countries of the Sahel, unfortunately, have always relied on others for their fight against terrorism. And this is not very good because the terrorists in this part of the world, they don't have uh, planes, they don't have uh, missiles, they, they just have this normal weaponry that is uh, taken from the military and uh, it could have been easier to fight it locally, but uh, politically and militarily. Unfortunately, this was not done. And the situation in the three countries that constitute the ASS, Alliance for the States of the Sahel, are situation is going from bad to worse. These landlocked countries have bad relations with their neighbors. Algeria, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, and Nigeria have suffered coup, have a weak and bad governance, and the security is very bad. The Global Terrorism Index 2024 find that three countries, the three countries of the ASS, are among the 10 countries most struck by terrorism, as they concentrate 50% of the deaths by terrorism in 2023. Even more, 
for the first time since its creation, the Global Terrorism Index notes that the number one uh, country among the countries most affected by terrorism is the Sahel country. As a quarter of all terrorism deaths occurring globally in 2023 were in Burkina Faso. However, one can notice that uh, since the departure of the French, the death toll by terrorism has declined in Mali. 753 in 2023 against 944 in 2022. The other other country, Chad, was not doing very bad against Boko Haram and in in the insecurity in Central Africa and was making good uh, amends with the rebel groups. But the war in uh, China, in Sudan is a very bad uh, omen for the security in Chad. Now, I would like to signal that uh, the way in which these countries are conducting their struggle against violent extremism is wrong and not driving in the right direction. It is quite obvious that their quest for legitimacy, in their quest for legitimacy, the military rulers in the ASS uh, countries are very close to the ethnical majorities in their respective countries. And as such, they perceive the ethnical minorities group that have extension in neighboring countries as enemies. For instance, in Mali, Tuareg, Arab Pearl are generally considered as group in favor of the violent extremists and that uh, they shelter and help the terrorists. I think the former uh, panelist has some say something about that, about the Znim. One can also note that ruling military regime in the ASS are concentrating all their efforts on the military, neglecting the economy and the social. This linked to the very harsh treatment of the minorities by the army and by Wagner is pushing more and more members of this minority group towards the violent extremists who exploit the situation and offer their protection. Here is another vicious circle. As closing remark, I'll say that the possibility of these countries Overcoming terrorism exists, but right now they are going the wrong path. And I am afraid that no sign of improvement is to be expected soon. One thing could invite to some optimism, and it is the fact that the ground of the Sahel countries is full of water and strategic minerals, which with the right partners could offer the opportunity to put these countries on the path of development. But the actual situation, in the actual situation, under the ground, the wealth under the ground is becoming more than a, more of a curse than a benediction. And unfortunately, the international, international players look at the Sahel countries just as a prey that must be captured and used for their own sake. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dahan, for this really interesting intervention, intervention from going uh, from general to specific. Shokran Jazilin. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the event, we are now opening the Q&A session. We have a good half an hour. Uh, and I'm really happy. And thank you all for sticking to the time because I do appreciate a Q and a, a Q, a good Q and a session. Uh, we have eight questions from the audience, which is great. But before that, uh, I would like to direct a brief question myself to each one of the speakers. I was taking good note uh, of everything of what was being said, please. I know these are questions that I am, that could be discussed for hours, try to be concise, uh, I try to prepare real quick three general questions that can be of interest for the whole of our audience, and then we'll go to the specifics 
that have been sent uh, by the RDM it's, uh, itself. So uh, I'll, I'll just follow the order. Uh, Wasim, not long ago, uh, following the collapse of the caliphate in uh, the Levant and Syria and Iraq, there were many voices, in my humble opinion, little educated or misinformed, uh, talking about a geographical shift, an unprecedented uh, mobilization of fighters towards the Sahel. Why uh, has this not occurred and what sets the Sahel apart, uh, making it less attractive for foreign fighter mobilization compared to other scenarios, if you may? Well, thank you for the for the question. Uh, first of all, yes, of course, uh, there was a lot of talk about a shift from the Levant after the loss of the uh, of the caliphate uh, by the Islamic State, but actually it is ignoring or uh, or um, being unaware of the efforts that were made by the Islamic State towards the African continent, and which are uh, which go back even 2013. Huh? Uh, we saw Turki al-Ban Ali, which became one of the uh, biggest scholars of the Islamic State. We saw him in Sirte uh, giving public uh, preaches in October 2013. Uh, we saw uh, Libyan fighters, which were uh, originally from, uh, from uh, Derna and Benghazi, who were fighting in Syria uh, since 2012, who were sent back uh, to Derna in 2014. The meaning, uh, meaning uh, even before the declaration of the of the caliphate, mm? to be part of what will become uh, the most one of the most important uh, territorial uh, control areas of the Islamic State in Africa, because it is only in Libya where they controlled uh, urban areas. It is only from Libya where they uh, planned uh, an attack uh, in Europe. Right? I'm talking about the Manchester attack 2000, uh, 2017. So the efforts towards Libya go back to 2013. We know that uh, Baghdadi, the former head of the Islamic State, sent one of his most prominent uh, aides uh, to Libya uh, in order to help them to build, make the build-up for the Islamic State there. I'm talking about Abu Ali al-Anbari in Iraqi from Salah al-Din, uh, who was the governor actually of Salah al-Din in, in, uh, in Iraq, and he was sent to Libya in the midst of the war with the coalition in Syria in 2014. And he was killed by uh, U.S. strike uh, south of Derna in 2015. So this is all documented, meaning that the effort towards Libya is very old and is, uh, is uh, preceded the loss of the caliphate. So it's not the loss of the caliphate that made them move uh, move uh, to Africa. They made efforts to expand uh, worldwide and especially in Africa way before losing uh, their caliphate. And this is actually what permitted them uh, to survive the loss of the caliphate. And today we are witnessing uh, a new dynamic uh, for the Islamic State, meaning that the loss of its territory made it much more flexible actually which reminds us, in a way, uh, when uh, Al Qaeda lost, it lost uh, its camps in Afghanistan and it spread, and uh, it went to Iraq. And uh, Al Qaeda Central became reliant on uh, Al Qaeda in Mesopotamia and in uh, in uh, in Iraq. So uh, that's the way it went for the Islamic State. The Sahel was an exception in many ways because it was the only area in the world what I call the Sahel exception, meaning the only area in the world where the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda didn't confront each other till the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. But this goes also because of uh, personal relations that people had together, meaning leaders, uh, which who try, who cho chose one group or, uh, or another. And it went without going into much details. We know that Abu Walid al-Sahrawi, for example, uh, he didn't have all the confidence of the Islamic State and uh, that the Islamic State Sahel province didn't exist before the death of uh, Abu Lulid al-Sahrawi, killed by the French. Because, Al because the Islamic State was very afraid that Abu Walid could make a, a second Julani, yeah? <laughs> what happened in Syria, meaning when they sent him from Iraq to Syria, Julani, and then he defected to Al-Qaeda. 
So they were afraid that because of the relations that Abu Walid had with prominent Al Qaeda leaders, his former companions actually, they were afraid that he will defect from the Islamic State and go back to Al Qaeda. So it didn't give him a province. And the Sahel was reliant or dependent on the Islamic State West Africa province, meaning Lake Chad and the and, uh, and Nigeria. So actually killing him uh, put, uh, gave more emphasis, uh, uh, put more emphasis from the Islamic State Central on the Sahel is the death of al Walid because they put up uh, and reinforced middle, uh, middle ranking leaders. They gave them a province. And actually this is, this is what I call the lottery of killing uh, jihadi leaders because you don't know you don't know who's gonna come next, and you don't know what would be his what would be his skills. So actually, it revigorated the group instead of instead of 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 uh, the, uh, the, getting it into demise because Abu Walid left uh, was killed, so he left the scene. Uh, Abdul Hakim died from illness, so he left the scene. Uh, other prominent, less known leaders also were killed or died, and so we, we have, have a new generation who gave new blood to the group actually and reinforced it. And it became today not only because of the killing of Abu Walid, but also because of French retreat, of American retreat. Now it's become an area where they have the freedom of movement, and as I said before, <laughs> the only, the only, the only uh, obstacle to their uh, development in the Sahara region actually is al-Qaeda today. So this is the new, this is the new, uh, the new dilemma uh, which is posed uh, at least for uh, the countries of, uh, of the Gulf of Guinea uh, uh, because actually the concern, the juntas are more, mostly concerned about preserving power and fighting jihadis. I'm not saying it's not on the table anymore, it is, but it's not the priority actually. It's a priority into communication, but not in reality. And if we look at what Mali did, for example, uh, or the Malian Junta did, the biggest military effort they did was against uh, rebel factions in the north. It wasn't even against uh, against uh, the jihadis. That was the biggest military effort and the most efficient military effort because it led to a victory uh, on the ground for the Junta, a political, uh, a political victory. And at the same time, in order to conduct such an operation, they cut a deal with the Islamic State, meaning they had like a kind of a ceasefire for a while. But as always, ceasefires don't, don't work out with the Islamic State. At one point, they come to an end, to a violent end. And this is what happened also, because the, the army wasn't able to deploy into Ansongo, which was kept and under Mbukan, sorry, which was kept by the Islamic State. And each time that the army tried to go that far, um, in a way, in um, in appliance with the deal that was cut, but they were stopped by the by the jihadis, and at that that went so far that even the middleman that was that had uh, that was handling the discussions between the Islamic State and uh, Bamako, which was a merchant uh, or or uh, a businessman from uh, in Araban, a cousin of the who belongs to the family of the leadership of uh, the Islamic State in that area, was killed by the Malian, and they said that. They killed a prominent Islamic State leader while they only killed the middleman. So you see, so it didn't work out. And today, the fact that um, they are unchecked uh, and unchallenged by other actors in this area makes it a big, a big hub for communication and also for, uh, for, uh, for. Uh, how can I say? We cannot talk about administrating a territory. But they are making effort to win hearts and minds. Because when you see that after, that's the way they function. You have blunt violence, very harsh violence. When they control, when they submit, they try to win hearts and minds for those who stay, for, for the people who stay. And we are seeing, I'm seeing, like they are distributing uh, like uh, 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 small uh, explanatory text to say this is our dogma. This is the way you function. Those are objectives. Those are our objectives. We are talking about the same pieces of writing that were the same, exactly the same, that was distributed in Syria back in 2013. And because we have a high toll of illiteracy in the area, they are making transforming them into audios. What is being written by the Islamic State from 2013 up to today, when it fits the Sahel, they are making it on an audio and co and spreading it through WhatsApp. So are adapting. They have a huge potential in Africa, and of course, 
that wouldn't have been possible, neither in the Sahel or in uh, Congo or in Mozambique or in Libya or wherever they are today in Africa without the prior effort that was conducted since a decade now. I hope I answered the question. Oh yeah, in, in, a, in a very uh, French way, in the way somebody whose uh, mother tongue uh, or one of us mother tongues is French. So you answered what I wanted you to answer and what you wanted to say, which I appreciate very much. <laughs> okay. uh, my question to you, Andrew, and uh, I, I beg you to be a, be, a bit a, 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 a briefer than, than we see him as, how, how global is the agenda of this organization? You, you talked about uh, local embeddedness, which is a point that really caught my attention, but uh, is it true that I mean, it, it is true, sorry, that they uh, have carried attacks against Western targets in the region, uh, but not outside. And that the discourse not always aligns with that of the respective uh, central organizations. Uh, and even if, of course, that's why we organize these events, even if uh, uh, violence in the West shouldn't be the only criteria, uh, do you foresee any changes in their modus operandi? So it's a very good question, and I actually, I want to say there are, there are sort of two ways to look at this, and sorry for being a little, I guess, pedagogical about it. Uh, I think one way would be looking at it in the, the local versus the global aspect. You can even, say, historically go back to Al-Qaeda Central and see even there the discussion about, uh, for instance, the very famous discussion about striking targets about the 9-11 attacks, um, about whether to privilege the near or the far enemy. And so this is something that's that's sort of intrinsic to the jihadist movement. Also, this discussion of tactics and and what actually makes the most sense, what constitutes a legitimate target. I think for for Jim in particular, um, is that there there isn't really a strategic need for it right now, or, or even a tactical need. There isn't much of a benefit. I, I think everyone um, uh, everyone has known for many years, or at least suspected for many years, that if then AQIM, now Jinim, wanted to conduct an attack in Dakar, for instance, or wanted to strike other targets in Abidjan or Accra or somewhere else. They certainly could. Uh, even when those attacks were conducted in the past, uh, thinking back to the Radisson, the Radisson Blue attack in Bamako in 2015, um, the attacks, uh, the attacks against the, the Sponge Hotel and the Cappuccino in Ouagadougou, these were attacks that were carried out by relatively few people. Um, so they can be done inexpensively. They can be done quite easily if the desire is there. I think it's a question of what's strategically um, necessary or what they deem strategically necessary. And they're in the process now of not just consolidating their territory, but also trying to maintain access to areas where they're not militarily active. Uh, Senegal is part of this, Ghana is part of this, uh, even parts of Cote d'Ivoire. So I think that's also very important. It's something that uh, it's possible that that calculation would change at some point in the future, depending on circumstances, and that they might see the need once again to go back to certain attacks against Western targets. But that was never really the core of operations of the group anyway, even kidnapping for ransom you know, while it also fulfilled in some ways an ideological function, was a very monetary decision, right? And there are just fewer Westerners in the Sahel right now, though that, of course, hasn't stopped. That didn't stop them from kidnapping a German priest in Bamako. Uh, but again, it's a, it's it's really about the strategic direction of the group. And actually, I, while I, I want to respect your your request to be brief, and I will be brief, I do actually think this is a really good way to bring in Liam's question about JNM's desired end state in the Sahel. Um, and I think what's important to remember is that there's this question that comes up sometimes about will JNM declare an emirate? They already have an emirate. For, for the group, they already have an emirate. It already exists. It doesn't need to be declared formally. And I think something that people sometimes forget or don't, or don't give enough credence to is that um, this group these groups learn, they learn lessons from the past and they, they learned an important lesson from 2012, which was that when they were directly in charge of governance in Northern Mali, it was not only very difficult, very complicated for them, it also made them a target, right? And it made them a target in ways that took years to recover. Um, and so 
there's also a, a strategic, um, a need for not only strategic patience, but uh, let's say um, for exercising a certain amount of discretion in how they behave. Because for right now, there's a benefit to not trying to take over Bamako, for instance. There's a benefit to not conducting an active campaign in Ouagadougou or even striking Niamey, right? So I think it's important that we not overly apply our frameworks and our kind of mental schema to these groups and not project them onto these groups, but think about in their terms, what exists, what is the goal? And so, and just to respond also to the final part about continuously, there are certain, we'll call them natural buffers to the expansion of West Africa, particularly the fact that as, um, as JNM would, would operate in areas that are less Muslim, it becomes harder to recruit. Now, of course, that hasn't been, that hasn't stopped attacks elsewhere in places where Muslim and Christian populations are quite mixed. Um, but there is a, there is a bit of a barrier. But also at this point, they've expanded so much. The, the actual geographic area is enormous that they cover and in which they operate. Um, so I don't think they necessarily need to keep expanding endlessly, though this will depend on, again, pressures they're getting internally and what their economic and political needs are. But they already do have an emirate. It already exists just in a, in a quite loose form in some areas. So, Joe, you're, you're muted. Sorry. I said that, uh, of course, and, and of course, every step, every decision is based uh, on a thorough uh, cost-benefit analysis. It's not because they have the possibility to run uh, structures in uh, relatively large swaths of territory. They're going to do it immediately. They're probably uh, drawing on from, from previous experience, not only in this hell, but also elsewhere, as uh, they are quite large, uh, uh, quite large organizations. Uh, yeah, my last question, trying to link mine with the first question of the audience uh, for you, uh, Dahan, is uh, uh, yeah, it has been mentioned uh, the, the the high degree of freedom of movement uh, due to uh, the, the 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 characteristics of such a large territory. Uh, that Janim enjoys uh, in central Mali and uh, northern Mali, sorry. Are those regions uh, uh, the ideal safe heaven for Al Qaeda veterans to seek refuge? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, I have to come a little uh, with uh, why what my two predecessors have said. And uh, I think that uh, the situation has changed a lot since 2012. And uh, that the violence that we see right now in the Sahel countries is uh, the share of uh, ideology in it is shrinking, except for the National Liberation Movement of Azawad, who wants some kind, the share that, that ideological share of the Jnim uh, um, or uh, the the other groups, it's it's not uh, it's no longer very important. What is very important for them is the control of corridors of mobility. What is important for them is con to control the roots of the traffic. And uh, effectively, they have these minorities that I said we, we have minorities, a lot of minorities in the Sahel countries that rely on them for their protection. And also they shelter in these minorities. So I think analyzing what is happening right now with this group, if you stick to the formal idea of that this ideological uh, Islamic state or Al-Qaeda uh, says it's, it's no longer in here in the Sahel. What they rely on is control the corridors of mobility, control the traffic. I have said about 
the quantity of heroin that is going through the Sahel, the quantity of gold that is going, the, the, the GTI uh, 2024 said that Jnim, for instance, control around 40% of Burkina Faso, which is the places where they have gold, they have, uh, and they perceive the, the ideology is only used as, for instance, you give us the zakat from the, 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 the gold and we protect you. And the ideology is no longer very important. The, what is important, you have here criminal uh, actuation. And the problem, I agree with one, my predecessor, uh, in the fact that, uh, for instance, the army is not very keen to attack them. They attack. Uh, I have I even heard one person from Mali saying, uh, if we defeat the secessionist, uh, terrorism will go. So they went to, to Kidal and did that. But uh, here is the desert. It's not France or Spain or the United States. And we are Bedouin. I said that in my presentation. The people from Kidal, they were no longer there when they come to the city. They, so they conquer that uh, houses and the people, they went in their tent in everywhere in the desert. You have to, to look at this problem in its global uh, geographical situation and in the economical part of it, that is the control of the routes of traffic. Uh, that is uh, what I say. I uh, think I, they no longer are very ideological about their, uh, the, the first ideologies of the Islamic State or of the Qaeda. They, they just use it for the control of the population that are under their rule. Thank you. Thank you, Dahan. Okay, uh, I just uh, combined two questions from the from the audience into one, uh, and I believe, uh, but I mean, uh, you, you can you can tell me otherwise. I believe this one uh, might be better answered by uh, Andrew Lebovich. How plausible is uh, for Janim's political efforts to has harvest sorry results for them, and what could these results be? Mixed with what prospects do you see for talks or negotiations between the states and jihadi groups? I mean, uh, do, 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 where is uh, Janine uh, trying to to uh, to arrive? What is the the aim? Because it's definitely the group that is most involved in 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 uh, building political relations. And what? Uh, yeah, what? Uh, could this harvest uh, them? So they're good questions. I, I think, uh, and, and Wasim, I'm not sure if Wasim will agree with me or disagree with me on this. I'd say certainly there are larger political goals that uh, Jim is working toward. Uh, certainly the withdrawal of foreign forces from the region, uh, at least concessions from the governments in place. If not, you know, they might say, for instance, implementation of the Sharia, but there might be other intermediate goals they'd be happy with. But I would say a lot of these local political engagements have been quite successful. If we look at, again, the group's ability to expand, their ability to govern in certain ways, their ability to extract taxes in the form of zakat, uh, these are all very important things. And I mean, there's a, there's a quite well-structured uh, infrastructure for uh, for resources, for not just zakat, but also uh, profit, uh, taxes on gold and other things that already exists. So to that extent, their political efforts have been, I would say, fairly successful at a local level. And the negotiations question is an interesting one, because I, I've done a lot of work on this over the years. And it, it's a question that that has been asked many times for as long as militancies exist in the Sahel, but it's often framed in terms of can you negotiate with them? And the issue is not can, because negotiations can always happen. There have been we seem pointed out the the contacts that existed with uh, with the Bazoum government before he was deposed in a coup. There have been efforts at outreach uh, to Jinim in Mali and elsewhere. So the the question is not can you negotiate? It's will would you be able to make the kinds of concessions that are politically acceptable uh, to say Mali, to Burkina Faso, to Niger, but that are also acceptable to Jinim. 
And that's, that's I think, where the real issue is. Uh, so negotiations are possible. There have been many negotiations at the local level on local issues, on ceasefires and truces, um, power sharing agreements, things like that. So, so yeah, there are already negotiations negotiations underway. There have been negotiations underway for years. Uh, but the question on, on sort of larger state level negotiations is a different one. It's again, it's not about can you negotiate or are negotiations possible. It's would you actually be able to meet some of the preconditions even for negotiations to go ahead and that's where i think the the challenge really lies but talks are always possible uh outreach is always possible it's the question of what what political arrangements would be acceptable to both sides and that's much more complicated okay uh well, thank you very much uh it was it was a an, an academic uh kind of answer uh, answering with another question or opening. I, I am an I, I am an academic at the end of the day. For 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 further brainstorming, you know that's that's really uh, what we uh, expected from the debate to to open uh, the box for everybody to think a bit uh, uh, or in different ways. Uh, Wasim, uh, we have a question for you from the audience. Uh, which says that you mentioned the Islamic stain is contained by Janim, but consolidating. By consolidating, are we talking about the group following a path somehow similar to the Islamic State uh, in the Levant, developing proto-state uh, structures? Can you can you can you just repeat the end of by consolidating what did, what did you it cut? Yeah, you mentioned that Islamic State is contained yeah. by Janim, but consolidating. Yeah. What do you yeah. mean by consolidating? Following the path okay. similar than that one mm. uh, by Islamic okay. State in the Levant, developing proto-state uh, structures. No, no, no. Many many people made the mistake to say that okay, uh, the, the caliphate is. Uh, being constructed in Africa as it was been being done in uh, in Syria and Iraq, etc. We are way too far from that, okay? Because one of the most important uh, things to keep in mind is that the the exception made of uh, Sirt uh, in Libya, they never controlled a major urban area in Africa ever. Uh, you have Mozambique where they controlled Palma and Masimbo or the Praia, but without the population. So it is uncomparable. Uh, what's unfolding in Africa is uncomparable with what unfolded in Syria and Iraq, uh, even on the, on the human resources level. We're not talking at all about uh, the same um, dynamics or the hijra from uh, many countries towards Syria and Iraq. Uh, We're not seeing the same thing happening into Africa. They are only active in um, rural areas and uh, not in any even small town uh, as we as we speak at least okay which goes for uh, uh, lake chad area and which goes for the sahel which goes for uh, congo which goes for mozambique etc et so uh, mm -hmm. by when i say when i say consolidating is that they are uh, they were uh, able to see that the french retreat from uh, mali at least will uh, create a no-fly zone de facto. So when they understood this beginning of 2022, they started an effort to control uh, most of Menaka. It went on from uh, March 2022 till the beginning of 2023, and they succeeded because they controlled the area of Menaka, exception made of Menaka, the town. Uh, the town. So now I mean, when I mean consolidating, mean that they control this area, they control the roads to this area, they con they tax the roads, they are uh, putting Menaka, the town, under a siege, and they are reaching out to the population uh, in the three border region. So especially Menaka, but also in northern, uh, eastern uh, Burkina Faso, and uh, in competition, as we said in the beginning of, uh, of my presentation, where they are in real competition uh, on the lands of uh, of, uh, of Al-Qaeda, you see? So when I say consolidating, that's what I mean. I mean, we are out of the phase of uh, uh, only blunt violence. We still have blunt violence, 
plus reaching out to the population, plus marking the territory uh, in regard of the competition with, especially in regard with of the with the competition of with the Islam sorry with the Islamic State. That's what I meant. Hope it's clear. You very clear. Thank you very much for the clarification. And we're uh, ticking at the top of the hour. Let me just address this one last last questions uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, Wild uh, Ahmed Mahmoud, and uh, uh, that will be it. The uh, hand, uh, if you may, the question is: ECOWAS is going through a multilateral crisis, given the withdrawal of Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. Will this compound uh, the problem of terrorism? Uh, I think the question was uh, intelligent because uh, I think that the terrorism in Sahel right now is mainly economic. I said they are controlling, they want to control the corridors, they want to control the road. And uh, we hope that ECOWAS is not going to fail completely. Uh, Mauritania is not part of it, but we are. Uh, we have an agreement with them. And we hope that with the new authorities that are in Senegal, uh, that it will uh, make some uh, reparation in its own uh, uh, behavior and stick to that economic part of its uh, origin. Uh, but uh, there is one thing that I want to underline here, and it's very important for me. Between the United States and Mexico, the criminal gangs are already having the control of the border. Now, if we stick on saying that the problem in the Sahel are the ideological uh, bands, ISIS or something, or Nemo, uh, we are in the wrong path. Now it's a criminal, and uh, the fight has to be against strict criminal gangs that are uh, controlling the routes of traffic, drugs, and uh, uh, goods and people and everything. And that is a big problem that we have right now in society. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dahan. And uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for joining us today. Uh, it has been uh, a plentiful and insightful uh, event. Special thanks to our uh, esteemed panelists, uh, Mr. Dahan Wild Ahmed Mahmoud, which is uh, answered the last question, Mr. Wasim Nasser, and Dr. Uh, Andrew Levich for sharing their insights and their knowledge with us today. And of course, to our technical team uh, for the organization and for being able to solve the problems uh, that appeared last minute. Really hope it has been uh, engaging and informative for the audience. It goes without saying that we look forward to welcoming you again soon. And uh, in fact, I mean, very soon might even be tomorrow as we at the program on extremism are holding another very interesting event where our senior fellow, uh, Dr. Amr Mohammed, uh, will be discussing the current state of current counterterrorism, an event that was delayed uh, uh, last week with Mr. Martin War, head of counter dash communication cell in the UK's foreign office on behalf of the global coalition to defeat uh, Daesh. You still, have, uh, you still have time to uh, register to attend. And just finally, do not forget to uh, subscribe to our newsletter to stay updated on future events, uh, publications and other activities. You can also follow us on Twitter at GWUPOE and or our YouTube channel. With, uh, where uh, this uh, event uh, that has been recorded will be updated in, can, in case you want to to catch it up on something you, you missed. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. It's been uh, a pleasure and uh, see you soon.